Welcome back to the Word Room. Today we are on Season 1, Episode 2 of The Chosen, reacting to the episode titled Shabbat. And Shabbat is the Hebrew word for Sabbath, so I'm assuming this episode will focus through the Sabbath and some of those traditions. So we're going to look at this episode. Now, I do want to remind everyone, you should be getting your information from the Bible. So this is a TV show that is what I would label historical fiction, right? It's adding in things. Now, it takes the historical information we have from Scripture, and it uses that and includes that, but then it adds in context and culture and historical facts that would all give what possibly could have happened in addition to what we see in Scripture. And it's a great way to paint a picture for you in your mind as you're reading the Gospels, the the culture and the context in which the events take place. That's very important and very helpful when understanding who Jesus was, but you don't need to build doctrine or theology off of a TV show. This is a TV show. Remember that. So you want to go to scripture for doctrine, theology, and for, you know, what we confirm and know actually happened with Jesus. And these other things should just be cultural context that gives you um, some understanding in your mind to place the events that are happening in scripture that, to the context of what actually would have happened during that day. It's a very interesting TV show, very fascinating. And um, I know there has been some controversy over the show, as I pointed out in the last episode. Um, one thing I would highly encourage everyone who is maybe skeptical about the show, don't base your opinions on the show on what you've heard people say. Watch the show watch some episodes and see is there anything within the show itself that contradicts scripture that would point to an incorrect Jesus, which um, some people claim most people who I've heard talking about how this show is bad, either have not watched it or even if they have, they can't point to anything within the show itself. That's contrary to scripture. That's contrary to Jesus, to the nature of God, any of Everything they point to is interviews they've seen with the creator of the show or um, comments that people who act in the show have made or the fact that there are people who work on the show who have different beliefs that wouldn't be biblical. Um, That's not anything to do with the show itself. If the show is portraying biblically accurate information and is not contradicting scripture and is not showing a false Jesus according to scripture— then there is no problem with the show. And I I make that case. I know people get up in arms about it. But remember, Passion of the Christ came out, made by Mel Gibson, who clearly has some very messed up beliefs, um, involved by Hollywood and production companies that weren't Christian. And yet, the Passion of the Christ is great. And there are tons of people who are concerned about this show, but didn't have that same concern with the Passion of the Christ, which I find very fascinating. Um, but definitely get your information from the show itself. Watch the show. You determine based on your own evidence from scripture and what you're seeing in the show, whether or not it's biblical or portrays the wrong Jesus. Do not go by just somebody on the internet saying something because people on the internet say all kinds of things. So go by what's actually in the show and what's in scripture and compare them yourself. That being said, this is episode two of season one, Shabbat. Let's go. See star. And if you think I'll fall for that, Eli, you must think I was born yesterday. Was there a Shabbat when you were little? Of course. Since the time of the covenant. Every seven days. Why so many Safta? Shabbat is a time for rest. And time to honor three things. Family, our people, and God. Family like Safta and Saba? Yes, and you, Ima and Abba, of course. Close friends are like family too. Who else? We honor our fellow citizens on Shabbat. Stranger Safta? We are all God's people. Even friends we haven't met. But most important of all, we honor God in all his works. We rest because he rested on the seventh day. We rest to refresh our souls to know him better. Very, very interesting opening scene. Now, this is hundreds of years before the time of Jesus. Um, They celebrated Shabbat or honored Shabbat 
way back from the time of the covenant uh, from Mount Sinai, back when they came out of Egypt in the Exodus, when God gave the command, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And they would follow and, and do certain traditions. Some of those traditions have evolved over time. But the important thing, a couple of these key things that you notice in this interesting uh, opening scene. First of all, you'll notice that the boy points to the sky and says, there's the first star. Now, of course, he's joking. And she said, you, you know, I'm not going to fall for that. But what that's referencing, the day in a Jewish day would go from evening till evening. So it would be at sundown to sundown would be a full day. So they, just like our technical days, start in the middle of the night at midnight, right? And midnight to midnight would be a day and not from daylight to daylight, right? So there's just backs up a few hours earlier at sundown to sundown. Now, they would count their day from sundown to sundown. So Shabbat or the Sabbath, the seventh day, which would be Saturday, would begin at sundown on Friday night and go till sundown on Saturday night. Well, they would, the way they would determine sundown. Now, now we know with modern technology, we can calculate sundown and, and have more of that um, scientific background to be able to determine that. But for them, the way they would determine if it was officially sundown is when they would see the first star in the sky. And so once they saw the first star, they would say, Hey, first stars here, Shabbat has officially begun. It's the now, the Sabbath. So that's what he's referencing there. She, he also mentions some words. He says Sabta and, and Saba, as well as she says Ima and Abba. Those are Hebrew words for grandmother, grandfather, and mom and dad, right? So um, that's how they would reference each other in Hebrew. Ima, mom, Abba, dad. Um, and then... It's kind of the Sabda and Saba. Those are the more informal, more way of saying like dad or daddy, like for Abba rather than Av, which is father. So these are the Hebrew words. That's what they're referencing there. Also, you'll notice she is lighting the candles. And this is very common in that day is that they would, the woman, and even today, the woman lights the candles for Shabbat. And the reason for that, the woman spends the entire day before Friday evening at sundown prepping. It's called the day of preparation. So she's doing all the work, baking the bread, cooking the meal, cleaning the house, doing all the things that would be required to prepare for Shabbat. And because she's doing all of this work, and the point of Sabbath is to remember that God ceased from his work um, on the seventh day, the idea is that she's done all this work, so she ceases from that work at the start of Shabbat. So she's the one that lights the candles to initiate the start of Shabbat to say, the work is done, we can now rest. That's why a woman would light the candles. Now, they don't see this obviously back then in this hundred year before Christ, or even in the time of Jesus, they wouldn't have recognized this, but it's very fascinating to me that Jesus himself in, in the New Testament is described as our Sabbath rest, right? And so he is our Sabbath rest. And it's a woman that lights the candle to initiate Sabbath, just like it was a virgin woman who brought about the light of the world, Jesus, who would be our Sabbath rest um, in Mary. So very fascinating parallel that, um, unfortunately, those who don't know Jesus or Yeshua as Messiah in the Jewish community, they don't see the symbolism there. But it's very interesting. Also, she mentions the three things about Shabbat. It's to honor family. It's to honor our nation is the, the history of Israel, and it's to, um, which is the covenant that they're honoring, and honor God for who he is and resting on the seventh day. Woman of valor, who can find her? This is the Eshet Chayim, an ode to women of valor. Far beyond jewels is her value. Her husband's heart trusts in her, and he should lack no fortune. There! May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. May God make you like Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. The sixth day, and the heaven and earth and all their hosts were completed. And God finished with
the man comes out and pronounces a blessing of the woman of valor. This was a blessing that would be spoken over on Shabbat, and this has been done for centuries, over the woman of the house, as well as all of the women there. It was a blessing over her that came, comes from Proverbs 31. You know, we've all heard the Proverbs 31 woman, right? This was a blessing spoken over the women um, to honor them and to esteem them. This is something that's still done today. It's been done for centuries. You also have a blessing spoken over the children. So you have a blessing over the sons that, that God would make them like Ephraim and Manasseh and a blessing over the daughters that God would make them like Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, and Rachel. And that God would make them basically these women who would carry the promise that would carry um, the, the covenant with God, just like with the uh, blessing over the boys that they would carry the covenant of God. Very significant. Um, in that a lot of times people think of these ancient Middle Eastern nations as not valuing women. And it was actually the opposite. Now there were different roles and different things that will, you know, that uh, among women and things that were, that we would in our culture view as um, not how we would, tr- you know, handle women and the roles of women in our society, but it wasn't a devaluing thing in that society. They valued women. They esteemed them which is why they pronounce these blessings and start out every Shabbat with a blessing over the women. Also, you'll see that he starts quoting at the end of that, the Genesis story and and rest, they would actually recount the story of Shabbat from Genesis, the creation through the commandments to keep the Sabbath day as well. So this is very, very factually accurate and historically accurate. We're celebrating the Shabbat. So very, very interesting. Back in Capernaum. The time of Jesus. You're so good at that. Mary. You try. Oh, no. No, no, I can't. Yes. I have seen you braid Leah. You are wonderful. <sighs> Do we have any flowers? Oh, I'll get the buttercup. Don't move. I'm sorry. Excuse me, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. So I find it interesting, the Pharisee, he's walking around the people. And when you first see him, his head's kind of up in the air and like he's all high and mighty, which was typical uh, mindset of Pharisees in the day. But then he sees Mary and Mary seems to be healed. She's acting normal. She's not having any issues. She's happy. She's smiling. And clearly he knows something has happened. Now, I believe this is one of the Pharisees that was there when Nicodemus tried to cast out the demon. I'm not 100% sure, but I believe so. And so he obviously knows something, you know, she was demon possessed. He'd seen her. She looks different. And so immediately takes off running. He's going to go back and tell the um, Sanhedrin and the, you know, the other Pharisees what happened and uh, that he noticed that the healing took place. Now, not, I'm not sure how, how they're going to take that or, or what that's going to mean to them. But remember in the last episode, Nicodemus said only God could heal her and now she's healed. So that's going to be interesting how that goes. What did he say? He detests you as much as I do. And? This was a horrible idea. Gaius, we must see Quintus. What? He does not need to clarify anything for you. I mean, do you have any idea who... No, clearly you do not, dumb question. Idea of what? Who you are dealing with. Yes, I do. Really? Yes. 
He is the Roman occupying overseer of this region, and his primary responsibilities are to enforce the law and ensure financial stability. I am aware of his responsibilities. I don't think you know what he's capable and if of. He's made a deal with this Simon person. I have valuable information related to his job. Have you ever heard of somebody making a decision based on a hunch? If he has, then I must let him know. Yes, you must. Listen, I don't want to have to carry your corpse out, so I'm going to wait outside for your replacement. Papaganus? Yes, Dominus. And are you his escort, Centurion? Yes. So where are you going? Securing the passageway, Praetor. Ah. Well done. Come on. So a Jew tax collector and his escort demand to see the Praetor of Judea. It's urgent, they say. A matter of life and death. Well, last night burned very hot, and today I'm asked, so I'll get to the point. Why should I not kill you both? You first. Dominus, I was recently approached by a man while at my tax collection. Bastard. He was many months delinquent. To relieve the substantial amount Skip of debt... Skip to the end. Did you hire a man to spy on Jewish merchant vessels fishing on Shabbat to avoid taxation? Yes. Simon. Is he in your district? He is. His debts are forgiven. Surprise. As well as those of his brother? His... Yes. Forgiven. Goodbye. Thank you for your time, Praetor. I do not find Simon reliable. Once he was deficient in his taxes, and when I pursued remedy, I discovered that he had spent an inordinate amount on games of chance at the local establishment. Additionally, based on his financial status, I questioned Simon's connections to the merchant class. We see Matthew here, um, and remember Matthew was a tax collector who was hated by his fellow Jews because he was seen as a traitor. And it's interesting, looking at Matthew in this clip, Matthew was fully given to betraying the people, the Israelites. He didn't, you know, he, he could have just collected the taxes, moved on, um, stole, did, you know, whatever he was going to do. But he goes further and he wants to catch Simon in a lie. He believes Simon is lying. He wants to catch him in a lie. He wants to get him in trouble. He goes beyond just confirming, hey, you made this deal. He's now saying, no, you shouldn't trust him. He's turning on the people of Israel, completely sold out to Rome. This is why he was hated, this is why tax collectors were hated. And I love that the show's portraying him fully as the way, you know, that he is fully given to this idea of working for Rome. He calls uh, Quintus uh, Dominus. Dominus is the word that means master. So he's literally saying, I'm servant to, I'm a servant to Rome as he's calling him Dominus. Um, he could have called him Praetor. He could call him you know, something else. He called him Dominus, uh, willfully calling him Master. And that's a very, very interesting in portrayal of Matthew. I also love the fact, I want to go ahead and point this out. Um, I do know that they are portraying Matthew as being on the autistic spectrum, which I think is great for representation. We don't know in Scripture whether Matthew was actually autistic or not. Um, but being a tech country, you'd be good with numbers. And so they're kind of, um, you know, there's a lot of autistic people on the spectrum who are really good the way they think and the way they remember details. Um, that would be a great aspect for someone who was a tax collector. So they're kind of using that and portraying them on the spectrum, which I think is awesome for representation. Um, and then we don't know if Matthew was actually autistic, but it's just a, it's a good way to represent a group of people who can find themselves in the story of Jesus, um, who oftentimes are overlooked. So I think that's really cool. Clearly, Matthew is fully sold out in his complete betrayal of the Jewish people. In spite of his current intentions, I do not believe you have an accurate understanding of what he can deliver. I'm sorry for this dishonor, Peter. Say your last prayer, Jew. You... Stay there a moment, Captain. Are you saying I made a bad deal? Yes. <laughs> Where did he come from? 
Here, Capernaum, Dominus. My brothers across the world search for brave men to spare and recruit, but our power prohibits those very efforts for what sane person would stand up to the Roman Empire. I am sane. Yes, but a very different kind of sane. Well, it won't surprise you to learn that to date, Simon has not fulfilled his obligation to uncover the tax evaders. He's in breach of contract. Not yet. But time may prove you out. I'll be in touch, Matthew of Capernaum. Thank you, Dominus. Thank you. All right, around for the table. Yeah. I need this to have a good time. What is this about? Oh, well, I can't celebrate my brothers and sisters. So, so, make sure Amos gets a side, though. He can't handle the good stuff. <laughs> to buy a Jason, you'll need this to drown your sorrows after you lose this game. And <laughs> You, I don't know your name. You're new, but wow, well, huh? We're not afraid you'll steal our fish. We're afraid you'll steal our women. Look at this man. Like Absalom, no? <laughs> Only better than Absalom. Stay away from low-hanging branches, my boy. <laughs> so Absalom um, in the Bible had long hair, famously, and ended up dying because he got his hair stuck in a tree as he was writing and got caught in a tree and hung. Um, so very interesting joke. Biblical joke there, which I find great that they threw humor like that in. Looks like Simon, who made the deal and got that money back and didn't have to pay his taxes, is living it up, which is probably not the wisest of decisions. What's your bet? What's your bet? Okay. Joe, and I see the hammer changed its rules on allowing children. Go get caught in a net. But you're here with a responsible adult. Uh, so make sure James and John get some too. Please, please, after you, please. What is that? Whatever do you mean, brother? Your face. You happy? Oh, I'm handsome. I just happen to be wearing a happy face. Buying drinks for the merchants. You fattening your lambs before the slaughter? No. I don't want you to be miserable. You are, so I should be too, no? I want you to be serious. This is not a game. Well, nothing wrong with enjoying a little financial freedom. A temporary reprieve from doom. Oh. Believe it or not, I don't like it either. But these men, they're not family. You and Eden are my responsibility, not them. You two keep me up at night, not them. And you want to be rich. Yeah, well, I thought I'd try the sentimental route. Maybe it's not my best look. Simon is, you know, living it up, but has not fully betrayed the merchants yet. Andrew clearly doesn't like it. He doesn't have, uh, he doesn't support this decision. He obviously is glad he still has the boat. He still has his home, but he doesn't support the decision of turning on the merchants and turning on other Jews. He's wrestling with that concept. Simon seems to kind of just be shoving it down and he said he didn't like it, but he seems to be shoving it down and just doing it anyway because he wants to be rich, make the money, live off Rome, and also support his wife and his brother. So there it's interesting painting this back story before Jesus calls them. Um clearly kind of showing the people we know from scripture Peter was rash, Peter uh, this would have been very similar to what Peter um, would have been like as far as his personality. Um, also, we know from history that fishermen were, were kind of the roughnecks, um, and that seems to kind of be what they're portraying the fishermen as. You saw John and James there as well, um, who were fishermen. So I, I like the, the historical aspect of that as well. Studying was 
Apologies, Rabbi. What is so urgent, Shmuel? The judges of our Sanhedrin sent for you. The Avbeddin himself requests your presence. God is good. What happened? by Nicodemus of the great Sanhedrin. We are greatly honored by your presence. The honor is mine, Abedin. I was given the impression there was a matter of some urgency. We are considering a formal inquiry. What are the charges? A miracle, Rabbi of Rabbis. This man's testimony is clear. His account, miraculous. The woman in the red quarter to whom you offered rights, she is redeemed. You, you saw her? Yes, teacher. Perfectly restored and radiant. Where? At the hairdressers at the market. Men are not allowed at the hairdressers. Of course, I did not go in. But she was on an errand. I believed my eyes betrayed me, so I followed until I was certain. There can be no doubt. The teacher. You were successful, I told Silence. You. This is an unparalleled revelation. You yourself pointed out that the depth of her demonic oppression was beyond human aid. We want to send word to Jerusalem at once. Abedin, with your permission, I would like to investigate the sighting myself before you conduct a formal inquiry into this or have news of its spread. We will, of course, yield to your request, but may we inquire as to the reason for your reticence? Just as this exorcism took some time to prove effective, it may have a tentative hold. It could come as a shock for a young woman of her station to be poured over by your learned judges, whereas mine's a familiar face. It is decided. Conduct your investigation, but please be efficient. News of this kind, it grows legs. So I find it interesting. He Nicodemus was affected by this. The fact that the demon spoke to him and said, you have no power here, and he couldn't perform the exorcism, that affected him. Uh, we saw that in the last episode. And then at the start of this scene, he is pouring over documents about demons and exorcism. Like he's trying to figure out why he had no power. He has all this authority, but no power, no actual supernatural power. And so he's pouring over the documents, trying to figure out what's going on. And then he gets called before the religious government who wants to open an inquiry. Now, of course, he thinks they're coming to charge him, uh, but instead they didn't charge him for not being able to perform the exorcism. They said the miracle was done. And so they're trying to figure out what's going on. They said, uh, the guy in the background said it was successful. Uh, they think Nicodemus and him doing the exorcism is what freed her. Of course, we know that it was Jesus, but he knows. Um, I think it's interesting that you can see it in Nicodemus. That, you know, he requests to investigate himself because he knows it didn't. It, it it didn't work. The demon told him he had no power. So it didn't work, and yet they're saying it did work, and he's so confused. Now, he doesn't know the details. He doesn't understand why, 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 what's going on, but he knows that he didn't have the power when he was there. So something's going on, so he's, he's questioning within himself, uh, and I think once he um, investigates, he's going to be doing a lot more questioning, ultimately leading to his meeting with Jesus. Andrew, Andrew, will you help me, please? Help you with what? Barely see anything. Of course, it's the darkest night in weeks. They're sailing late because they're not cleaning out the holds tonight. They're definitely sailing tomorrow. I'm guessing it's Amos. This is all a waste of time if it is. What do you mean? 
What I mean is Gideon and Tobiah sail with Amos. Well, I'm not saying it's Amos for sure or not. Whoever it is, they're definitely sailing tomorrow. We got them. We got them. Those are our brothers. Tobiah looks to you before his own father. So what? Well, it's my fault that a dumb kid doesn't know better? I keep waiting for you to tell me this is all part of a plan to double cross the Romans. Andrew, there's a crew out there. That crew is stealing food out of Eden's mouth. They're gonna take our boat, maybe our lives. Maybe. But we made our choices, too. You think this was a choice? So Andrew clearly doesn't want to do this. Um, Simon is making excuses for why he's doing it. He even said, do you think this is a choice? He's trying to act as if he has no choice. Um, really, he does, but he's trying to act as if he doesn't because it's an easier choice to make to betray his people than to see his wife lose her home, her money, lose everything. And um, so it's a hard choice, but he does have a choice. And he's wrestling with that choice. You're not teaching today. I have research. Now don't be too long. Our guests will be arriving early. Oh. Nico, they are dear colleagues who admire you. They have been waiting weeks for the teacher of teachers to lead Shabbat. It will be like sharing loaves with God himself. Sharing? Lo <laughs> Am I the only one hearing this? It's a small gathering. They just go through it quickly. I'll try to avoid spending too much time honoring God and our heritage. Listen to her. She's like, oh, you know, it'd be like having sharing loads with God himself. And Nicodemus' response, am I the only one hearing this? He's real, like, he knows after that encounter, that arrogance that Pharisees have, it's been knocked down when he realized he had no actual power. And he's wrestling with that in his mind. And um, of course, his wife is still every bit as arrogant as she always has been. <laughs> Are you the Messiah? Hi! Yes! Do you want to lose that ugly nose of yours? Thank you. Only one language keeps their peace, Marcus. Learn to speak it. Interesting scene that shows Ro the Romans, their issue, they allowed the Jews to have their own religious beliefs and their own religious practices and to kind of do their own thing in that regard. But they, the one thing the Romans were afraid of was an uprising. Um, they did not want an uprising of Jews. They, they wanted to keep the peace. No Jews gathering together, no plans of uprising, no um, issues there. And I think that's interesting that you can see, hey, there's one language they speak. Fourth, we've got to hold, you know, keep that force on, keep that threat of violence on. Otherwise, they might try to uprise against us. Matthew, another unhappy citizen expressing his disapproval. I'll be fine. Oh, you're disgusting. Go home. I have a job to do. My father never allowed me to shirk responsibility. Well, he raised you right. You must have Roman blood. We don't speak. Jews are odd. People are. How can you not have a relationship with your own father? He says he has no son. Next. I got them. At least I think they're right. That's what everyone else was getting. Oh, what did you get, Maddie? Shabbat candles. Okay, I would not have guessed that. Maddie's for Shabbat dinner in a little while. In a long while. I barely remember how to do it. It will be great. I know how to make the bread. Part of it. <laughs> what do you make part of a local bread? 
If you're hosting Shabbat, sweetheart, you better get moving. Reparations might take you all afternoon. Really? Just to be safe. I haven't even swept. Get out of here. Get the fire going first thing. Mm, I'm excited and a little terrified. After you, Ned, rest the dough. Mm. What this kind of advice? What could go wrong? Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. All right, I love that Mary's going to host a Shabbat dinner. She's been redeemed. That's a great, uh, great way to show, hey, she's going back to the covenant, going back to God and hosting Shabbat, which I think is awesome. Um, I do want to point out that they, they mentioned two things here. They said, if you're going to prepare, it's going to take you, you know, all day uh, or afternoon at least. And that's something that's true. They would prepare for Shabbat. They called it the day of preparation. And all day Friday before sundown, they would be preparing for Shabbat. I also, um, they said Shabbat Shalom, which is the common greeting on Shabbat to say Shabbat Shalom. They would say Shalom as a way of saying hello or goodbye. It, was a, it means peace. And so they would say, may, basically, may peace be with you is what they're saying when they say Shalom. Well, when they say Shabbat Shalom, it means may you have a peaceful Sabbath. So it's, it's peace and Sabbath together, Shabbat Shalom. And it's a common greeting on Sabbath. It's you. It's real. Lilith. No, no, please, don't be frightened. My name is Nicodemus. I, I minister to you, Lilith. I don't answer to that name. I am Mary. I was born Mary. But... You were called Lilith, yes? Please, I must go. No, no, please, Mary. I, I am desperate for your help, Mary. I'm a, I'm a Pharisee. I'm visiting from Jerusalem. I'm a man of God. And I believe you have experienced a miracle, Mary. Are you really a Pharisee? Yes. I'm sorry, I wasn't... I'm not here to enforce Jewish law. So she immediately covers her head when she finds out he's a Pharisee or when he confirms he's a Pharisee. That wasn't Mosaic law. There was no law in the law of Moses that say women have to have their heads covered, but it was rabbinic law, which means the rabbis taught this as an interpretation of certain things within the Torah that to be modest women would cover their head. So she covered her head once she said, and you know, she realized he's a Pharisee. He said, I'm not here to enforce uh, Jewish law or religious law. So he's not there to enforce the law. He's trying to inquire about her. I also love that he called her Lilith. And she said, I don't answer to that name anymore. I'm Mary. Uh, she's let go of that previous identity that she used to have. So how do you know who I am? You really don't remember me at all. I burned incense. I don't remember. It's all a blur. I can't go back into that. No, no, I don't want you to. I can't even imagine. But you you are healed. That, that much is clear. I just want to understand how it happened. That makes two of us. <laughs> how long after my visit did you feel the change? It wasn't anything you did. <laughs> it was someone else. Some one else? He called me Mary. He said, I am his. I am redeemed. And it was so? Who did this? I don't know his name. And even if I did, I could not tell you. Why not? His time for men to know has not yet come. His time for men? <laughs> he performs miracles and seeks no credit? What does he look like? Is he a member of Sanhedrin? Would you at least know him if you saw him again? I don't know why I am sharing this with you. I... I don't understand it myself. But here is what I can tell you. I was one way. 
now I am completely different. And the thing that happened in between was him. Wow. So yes, I will know him for the rest of my life. <laughs> I have to be home to prepare for Shabbat, as I'm sure you do. So when did you even hosting Shabbat dinner? It will be nothing like yours, I'm sure of that. But I'm going to try. Shabbat Shalom, Nikodemus. Shabbat Shalom, Mary. Wow, what a scene. So, he, <laughs> I love how he thinks it's, you know, how long after my visit did this happen? And he's trying to figure out, you know, I, I thought I had no power. What's going on? And she realized that she said, it's not anything you did. And so, like, mind blowing to him. He, he's like, she said it was someone else. And he's like, someone else like that just shocked him. And he's like, who, you know, if I don't have power, then who does? Who, who did this? And I don't think that when he's asking, you know, is it a member of Sanhedrin? Is it who, who is this? Uh, what's his name? I don't think he's doing it because he, like, in a facetious way. I don't think he's, he's like, jealous or I think he's curious because he doesn't have power. He knows he's lacking something and this other person has it and he wants to know what it is. And um, he wa I think he's truly seeking some kind of connection to God. And uh, to figure out what he's lacking with his connection to God. And I think that's uh, what leads to his conversation with Jesus in the Bible that I'm sure we'll get to in a future episode. But I think that's interesting. Also, I love um, Mary's statement. Now, we can't go past that statement. She said, all I can tell you is that I was one way and now I'm completely different. And the thing that happened in between that is him. And what an incredible picture of salvation. We were one way dead in our sins. Now we are new creation. I love it. You know, it kind of actually sets up the conversation about being born again, uh, new birth uh, that happens in John 3 with Nicodemus. I was one way. Now I'm something completely different. And the thing that happens in the middle, that middle connecting point is him. How powerful of a statement. It is Jesus that makes the change. So incredible. Good morning, Ralph. It's not morning. Good first seeing you then. Mm. The bird is wonderful. I know. How's fishing? It's fine. Really? You're surprised. Why would I be surprised? I don't know. You tell me. You haven't taken a catch to market for days. And yet you have uh, flour, vegetables. Did you sleep in a warm bed last night? In fits. Why are you baiting me? I don't understand what's happening. Nothing is you happening. You don't sell to market. Your hours are upside down. And your face is frozen in worry. Don't tell me nothing is happening. We're in a challenging season right now. I just need to work hard to get through it, and I'll get caught up tonight, and I'll be right tonight? on the way. Tonight? What do you mean? I'm not happy about this either. I need to work tonight you so that... You need to work on Shabbat? It's a special circumstance. I can't get into it right now. Andrew will be here for dinner as normal, and I'll just be gone for a few hours. Oh! Well, would you like me to fix your Shabbat plate to take with you? Listen, love, I know this Don't is not ideal. Don't listen, love me. I'm not a child. I just need you to trust me on this. Please. I've... I've got this, Eden. You answer to God, not me. But next time, you answer to the both of us. Because whatever this is, I don't have the strength for it twice. So I find it interesting that, uh, first of all, um, you always know, um, as a married man, I know if there's loud chopping, 
and the chopping gets louder as I approach, <laughs> it's probably not a good sign, right? Um, she's obviously mad. She knows something's going on. She doesn't know exactly what it is that's going on. Um, and he's like, why are you baiting me? Just tell me what you're thinking. And she's saying, basically, it doesn't add up. You're saying that you're catching the stuff. You're saying things are going good, but you haven't been to market. Something's going on. You're not telling me the truth. And um, ultimately, it boils down to, I love the statement she said, you answer to God. He's trying to make excuses. He doesn't want to tell her because he knows she will not approve of him betraying um, their people. But she said, you answer to God, but next time you answer to me and God. In other words, you know, I'm, I'm trusting you, but if this, if some, this next time, this is not going to go this well. Uh, you're obviously hiding stuff from me. You have your reasons, but I can't do this again. So do what you're going to do, but next time it's going to be very bad. And um, he, in his mind, he's trying to justify what he's doing for her. And then for her, she just wants him to, to partner with her and do this together. And um, clearly that's causing some friction. assuming that was Matthew's family and uh, he was going to Shabbat dinner, but backed out. Now, earlier in the episode, he said his dad said he didn't have a son, which would make sense that he would be disowned from his family as a result of being a tax collector. Um, now, again, we don't know if he was disowned from his family um, in scripture, but that would be logical and would make sense. Um, they were hated by the people. And um, probably shamed his family. I think it's interesting, though. He goes, he's going to go to Shabbat, but he chickens out. He doesn't go in and uh, walks away. So he clearly doesn't feel welcome there, um, even for Shabbat. This is the last of a long line of traditional works that is What's on your mind, love? As my nan. Do you know the significance? Tell me. 200 years ago, we were ruled by the Greek king Antiochus IV. He suppressed our religious observances. It wasn't until the Maccabees revolted and ushered in the Hasmonean dynasty that our worship was restored. You are as smart as you are handsome. Who is responsible for suppressing our worship now? I fear I know the answer. It is a beautiful tapestry. Should the artist have made it less so? To what purpose? Sadness? A conquered people? You are wise as you are beautiful. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, Rabbi. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Oh, honored Rabbi. We are humbled and honored by your presence in Capernaum. You make us whole. Only God can do that. Shall we join the others? Thank you. Try to get the seat near the head of the table. All right, so some key things happen. Several things happen in that scene. First, right there at the end, he says, try to get a seat near the head of the table. That's obviously setting up Jesus' teaching where he says, no, don't try to get a seat at the head of the table. Don't try to sit 
in the esteemed place, but those who make themselves low or are in humble themselves are the ones who end up being esteemed. Um, so that's an interesting little throw in there. He also says, you make us whole. You being here, your presence here makes us whole. And Nicodemus says, only God can do that. He's obviously wrestling with this concept that he is not what he thought he was. His arrogance and his yeah, that overinflated ego was brought way down when he couldn't cast out the demon in Mary. Um, also, he's looking at this rug from a time period when they were under Greek uh, uh, under Greek bondage, and uh, they weren't allowed to worship freely. And then um, he's talking about how they weren't able to worship freely until the Maccabean Rebellion, which you can read about. It's in that in-between period between the Old Testament and the New Testament. But I think it's interesting that he says the statement, who is suppressing our worship now? I'm afraid I know the answer. Now, I think his wife takes that to mean Rome, but I don't know if that's exactly what he meant. Um, he's wrestling within himself, and I think he's realizing that a lot of their traditions and, and the stuff they do is suppressing the true worship of the true God, giving them the power that of the prophets, you know, Elijah, Elisha. They haven't had that in generations and he's saying he thinks that it's their own rebellion against God or their own traditional mindset that's not connecting them to God. So I think that's interesting. Um, also, his wife makes, even though she thinks he's talking about Rome, she makes an interesting point. She says, and this is why he says she's wise. He says, she says, should the artist who made that tapestry, that rug, who made it during a time when they were being oppressed and their worship was being oppressed, should the artist have made it a ugly rug, not made it beautiful, not, not created such a beautiful art piece. To what purpose would that be? Because to, to sadness, because they're under oppression or should you still find beauty in the ashes? Should you still find beauty even in a time where you are broken? And I think she, you know, Nicodemus takes that and says she's wise because he's in a time of being broken, but he should still honor God and see God in, in the beauty of the, you know, Shabbat and everything that they're doing while they, while he's waiting and seeking these answers. So very interesting point. A woman of valor who can find. Mary. Come in. I'm so glad you came. Oh, thank you, Miss Mary. This is a fine place. Oh, thank you. Are we on? Is it still on? Yes, Shula. How did you find us? I followed that mule, Barnaby. <laughs> Not that he waited. Looking as handsome as ever, Barnaby. Come. Lucky guess, Shula. <laughs> Is this the place? If Mary's here, it is. Do I know you? Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm James. This is Thaddeus. We were told this would be a good place to come. James and Thaddeus. Oh, oh no. So this would be James the Less. And Thaddeus, too, the disciples of Jesus. Well, uh, yes, I... I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I see food. That's a victory. Doing something wrong, you tell me. Oh, nonsense. It's already great. Can't remember the last time I was invited to Shabbat dinner. Me? Never. you never been to Shabbat? Of course I've been to one. Been to lots. Just never got invited. <laughs> 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 Who's the extra seat for? Oh, uh, for Elijah. Am I right? I, I remember my mother always setting an extra place for Elijah. That's only for Passover. Just once a year at Seder. Oh. Well, when Seder comes, I'll have a head start on setting up. <laughs> <laughs> So I love this image of Mary doing Shabbat. You know, she's been so long since she, she had been since she was a child, which at that time she wouldn't have been the one in charge. So she's trying to remember certain things and uh, it's been so long and it's showing how 
even though she's been set free and she's trying to, she's not perfect. She still gets things wrong. And I think that's, it's a cool way to show that. I also love that these are two of the people that become Jesus and disciples at the table um, with Mary. And then these are the people that would be outcasts. You have Barnaby and um, this blind woman, Shula, I think they said her name was. And clearly these are the people that would be outcasts. They wouldn't be welcome at Nicodemus's table, for example. Um, but here's Mary, and she's hosting it, and I think that's awesome. Yeah, just take a look at my little notes. <laughs> Can I read it for you, Mary? Stop it, Barnaby. I read better than you. <laughs> My father taught me. Very impressive. <sighs> uh, oh, uh, is the first star out? Yes, let's eat. Like I said, you are very popular. Or it's a Pharisee here to shut us down for letting you be here. <laughs> Hello, Mary. Jesus. To see you. Yes. Yes. I don't want to be rude, but would it be okay if, if I. Oh! <laughs> yes, of course. Please come in. I just never thought you'd. Um, I, I have guests here. Uh, this is my first time. I don't know what I'm doing. Rabbi. Rabbi. You already know these men. They are students of mine. I trust they have been polite. Of course. Your guests can take the seat. Yes, Mary? Oh, of course. <laughs> yes, of course, please have a seat. I keep saying of course a lot. <laughs> um, Francis is the man I told you about who, um, who helped me. Oh. Yes, yeah, Mary told us so much about you. Oh, I hope not too much. I'm Barnaby. This is Shula. She is blind. Ah. In case you couldn't tell. I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I don't actually know your name. I'm Jesus of Nazareth. Huh. Well, apparently something good can come from Nazareth. <laughs> So a couple of key things that I noticed there. Number one, Jesus took the seat of Elijah, um, which is interesting. She set that seat out just for Elijah, which you don't do much. It's Passover. And of course, um, this is Shabbat, not Passover. But she had set that seat for Elijah, and now here's Jesus sitting in that seat. Elijah was prophesied to come before the Messiah to make the way for the Messiah. And uh, now here's the Messiah sitting in that seat, which is super interesting also um <laughs> he says something good can come out of nazareth well now that, that was a you know nathaniel i believe in the bible when god calls him or when when he's told that uh the messiah is there and he's from nazareth he said can even good come out of nazareth and nazareth was a little small town not much uh prominence there so that's why that that joke is being made um I also find it interesting um, that he's already called, so we didn't see the call of Thaddeus and uh, um, James, the lesser. We didn't see that. Um, so clearly that's already happened, and they are already uh, his disciples. Mary, I'm honored to be here. Why don't you begin? Oh, no, I, I couldn't know that you are here. You must. Thank you, but this is your home, and I would love for you to do it. Okay. I'll just, uh, I'll just read from this now. Now the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their hosts. And God completed on the seventh day his work that he did. And God. God abstained on the seventh day from all the work he did. And God blessed the seventh day, and he hallowed it. For thereon he abstained from all the work that God created to do. Blessed are you, Lord our God, 
ruler of the universe, you have who creates the fruit of the vine. You have lovingly and willingly given us. You have lovingly and willingly given us your Shabbat as an inheritance in memory of creation. Because this is the first day of our holy assemblies in memory of the exodus from Egypt. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth the bread from the earth. Amen. 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 Wow, that was good. So a couple of things in that last scene that I think is very interesting. It shows the different Shabbat ceremonies. Now, the, the cool thing is there as a, it shows a couple of things. Number one, rich, poor, super religious, don't know what you're doing. They all came together for Shabbat. It was like a unifying thing within the country. But I find it interesting the four different Shabbats that it shows. So it shows Mary with Jesus and his Shabbat. It shows Nicodemus and the Pharisees. It shows Simon and his wife and Andrew. And it shows Matthew eating by himself. All four of these are very interesting to me. Out of all four of that, Shabbat was more than just not working and remembering that God rested. It was a day to honor God and honor his presence that he created creation and on the seventh day rested and uh, dwelled within his presence, and you know, his presence dwelled with, with man. And I think it's interesting that the only person out of the four that it showed that actually had the presence of God there with them was Mary, um, the one who no one would expect, right? Matthew, who had betrayed his people and, um, was eating alone. He had betrayed everything and walked like gave up every every bit of family. He was eating alone. He had no presence. He had no people, no family, no anything. He was walking in open rebellion against the covenant. Then you had Nicodemus who was going through the motions. It kind of goes back to that they were looking at that rug, right? Go through the motions even though you're not experiencing what you want to experience yet. So Nicodemus is going through the motions, saying all the right things, doing all the right things, but void of presence, which is the exact situation Nicodemus found himself in in trying to cast out the demon, is that he, he could go through the motions, but he had no power, no authority, no actual connection to God. And, and he realized that and that should have seen in his Shabbat. He's going through the motions, but he doesn't have presence. And then you have Simon, who is someone who is struggling. Like he doesn't want to walk in rebellion, almost, but he feels like he has no choice with the Romans, and he feels trapped, and he feels broken, and he doesn't know what to do, and he's making the wrong decisions, but he doesn't want to. So you have someone making wrong decisions who doesn't want to, you have someone going through the motions, and you have someone walking in open rebellion, all three of them lacking the very presence, while you have someone who was forgiven much, loving much, and sitting there with presence at the table, which is incredible. It's just an incredible picture that they painted with those different scenes. Um, and then, of course, it ends with Simon and the Romans there for him to spy on the merchants and to give up the merchants. So I feel like, uh, I don't know, next episode or whatever, it's going to go into that, and I'm interested to see how that plays out. Hope you enjoyed Season 1, Episode 2, Shabbat. Stay uh, tuned for next week. We'll have Episode 3. You don't want to miss it. Subscribe if you have not subscribed. Like the video, share the video, and comment down below what's your favorite part of this season and this episode. Till next time.